here's the kicker. Kevin, welcome to Voices in Transformation. I am going to hit you right away with one big question, which is, what do people get wrong or what is the biggest misconception of generative AI in the supply chain space today? Well, I'm going to give you a bonus answer. I think there's two and they're at opposite ends of the spectrum. Uh, on the one hand, I think there is a group that thinks it's panacea that's going to solve everything from world hunger to you name it. And at the opposite end of the spectrum, it's quite the opposite. That they're, They believe it's a toy. It's a fad. It's something that's going to come and go. And I understand that point of view, given the amount of hype that's around it, but I, I don't think that's the correct answer either. I believe the truth is is somewhere in the middle. And what is that truth? I, I think that, it, first of all, it's a it's an incredibly enabling tool. Uh, if used correctly, if you understand the strengths and weaknesses of it, like any technology, uh, it, it's it's going to really change the way that people interact. And, and, and I, I really do believe it's here to stay. I think that it's, uh, it's something we're going to look back and realize is a pretty fundamental moment of transformation uh, in the way that people engage with solutions. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but you know what? I, I've got to ask you, there's a lot of cynicism in the room. You you alluded to it just now in terms of hype, right? There's a lot of hype. So there's yes. a, how do you separate the, you know, the, pe the, the actual solutions that will make a difference and move the needle in supply chain today from that hype? Yeah, I think it comes down to how people are bringing it to bear. Uh, I think, you know, we, one of the, the phrases that we use is built in, not bolted on. And that's because there are a lot of folks out there that are, that, you know, much like, much like in a, in a bygone era, the, 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 the term dot com got taped onto the end of so many businesses, uh, because people thought that that changed, that changed the universe for them. Uh, there are a lot of people that are effectively bolting on the, a generic untrained generative AI solution just for kind of the coolness factor of being able to have a narrative interface. And that just, that completely misses the point, right? I, I, what generative AI can do for you is number one, it can simplify the interaction between people and software enormously by kind of speaking in the client's, the user's native language, which is, you know, narrative text. Um, but if you don't constrain appropriately the domain, then you run into problems that that uh, you hear a lot about in the press, where people are, are training on a broad set of data, which includes, frankly, a lot of unreliable information. And on top of that, supply chain is a very specific space with a very specific language. And if you're not building a knowledge graph underneath it so that it navigates that responsibly and, and answers uh, questions in the context in which a supply chain user would ask them, then you run the risk of, of getting information, you know, as simple as hallucination, but as complicated as just out and out uh, misinformation. Okay. Use cases, because I keep hearing from people that uh, generative AI sounds great. It's great in theory, but are people using it? Are people actually even using it today? So can we talk a little bit about actual use cases in the supply chain industry today? Absolutely. I, I, you know, when you think about it, there is a pattern that kind of, um, reaches beyond just supply chain into any technology realm, which is there are times when I, I need information on very specific question. And I may not ever need the answer to that question ever again. And I need to be sure it's right when I get it. And that I think is a, an incredibly powerful category of use cases for supply for, for generative AI within supply chain and elsewhere, frankly. And it's that it's that, you know, in the past we would maybe walk into an IT organization and say, can you build me a report that tells me this thing? with the implicit under, undertone of, I may never need it again, right? Well, now you can bypass all the delay, all the friction that can exist in this idea of creating a one-off report because it can retrieve the information for you. It can validate as you go how it's sourcing that information so you know you're getting it the right way instead of back and forth with someone generating a report. So that's just like the bare use case. The most obvious use case is complex data retrieved trivially. But at the same time, there's several other really obvious and easy use cases. Think about when you're onboarding a new planner into an organization. Mm -hmm. They know supply chain, or you probably wouldn't have hired them, but they may not know the particular piece of software that you're using. Well, our solution has the ability to say, uh, I, would like to, I would like to go override the forecast. And he would say, oh, you want this page, and it will navigate you there. So that the ease with which it can help to onboard a new employee help someone who has deep supply chain knowledge get to where they need to be to do the thing they need to do 
is another thing that may not be quite as obvious from a solution standpoint, but it's incredibly mm -hmm. powerful. And then finally, if you if you think about the notion of large scale tedious changes within a platform, you know, anytime you do something that's tedious, you run the risk of boredom, which mean which introduces the risk of error pollution, you know, pollution of the data with errors that are very hard to find. Uh, well, what if you say, I would like to override my forecast for blue lawnmowers for the summer months? Well, narrative AI can parse all that out and say, do you mean, and feed back to the list of products that fit that description, list of months or quarters or weeks that fit that description, and show you what the data would look like so you know before you commit it. And if you think about all the keystrokes that that can mean in some solutions, that's a really powerful tool as well. So those are, I think, some of the some of the entry-level use cases that we're talking about, but we've also got some, some pretty substantial use cases beyond that that we think are really exciting uh, in the notion of creating and managing complex scenarios. Again, something that can be very tedious, typically is very time sensitive. And so if you can get answers to questions much more quickly and much less tedium, that's an incredibly powerful tool. And one of the things that I really liked about what you were saying or, you know, since we've been talking has been the fact that you guys seem to say that Gen AI is not this, it's not just about looking at it from a technological perspective. It's like your new employee. Can you talk me through a little bit about that? Absolutely. Think about it. You know, just the examples I just gave. It's a tireless employee. It never gets bored. And it's willing to go look until you're satisfied. All right. So if you think of it almost, you know, think of the concierge is a term we use a lot. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, it's almost like a, a concierge into your system. And, you know, while the first few case, use cases are all interrogative in, in nature, uh, there's also a lot that it can do for you, uh, and, and including, you know, looking into the future, the ability of scheduling jobs, checking out the health of a particular program. Right. These are all these are all things that it, that it could do just as you might hire a junior level employee to do. So well, the thing that we think it's ex so exciting about it is it empowers planners. Right. This is something that's it's not going to replace planners. What it's going to do is elevate the level at which they're able to execute because they'll be focused on the truly complex value added decisions that that they would prefer to be making. We prefer for them to be making at, at the expense of no longer having to do the trivial, boring, distractive behaviors to, to kind of pacify software. So the future is sure. for the enhanced planner then? Absolutely the case. Kevin, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, likewise. Thank you so much. Hey, Sartak, thanks for being here on Voices in Transformation. I'm going to kick it off with the first question, which is, what do you think people get wrong about generative AI today in supply chain? Hi, Maria. Um, so I think there's three things that people get wrong. The first item is this confusion still about what is machine learning and AI versus generative AI applications. And so, you know, they'll invariably start with perhaps I can use Gen AI for machine, you know, for forecasting, where it's clearly or for optimization. Mm. It's not the right fit. So that's the first thing, you know, m many folks get wrong. The second is there still some legacy skepticism about the privacy and security and the hallucinations aspect of Gen AI? Um, stemming from the early days where, you know, when you any anytime you ask a question on ChatGPT, it's it's in the public domain effectively. That's changed, right? Like there's a lot more um, enterprise grade security options available to unlock Gen AI use cases. And then the last one is there's also legacy expectations around how long does it take to unlock um, projects, you know, to execute projects. So traditionally, when you think of planning implementations, sourcing implementations, it's it's months and years. Gen AI is a different beast, and many executives don't fully grasp that certain use cases of Gen AI, where you're really leveraging the capability of the large language models and operating in the in its strength, like like contracts and all of that, it's super quick to unlock the value. So think, you know, days and weeks and not months and years. And, and let me ask you, from Deloitte's perspective, what are the main cultural or organizational challenges that companies face, you know, when they're trying to integrate AI into their supply chain? The, the first challenge is it's not clear to executives where to start. Because they've got so many different options on where to start with Gen AI. You could go operate in the space of 
sourcing and procurement in contracts. You could do customer service. You could do, you know, customer facing sales. You could do planning interventions, data driven insights using the natural language layer. So it's unclear to them where to start. Um, the second issue is even once they had identified the right use case, it's not very clear do how to unlock the use case. There's options in the market and everybody claims they can do it. Do you use it integrated into your planning systems, integrated into ERP systems, integrated into your data lake, build internally, leverage your startup, right? It's not clear where to proceed uh, or even a control tower system. So there's so many options, it's confusing. The last challenge is that it truly requires a shift in thinking, a mind shift change to go from deterministic that, okay, when I do a planning implementation, it takes me eight months to do this or a year to do this. In this case, you don't know. You almost need to feed the data and like, you, you know embrace a little bit more of an exploratory and creative problem-solving approach to build that muscle that is required to unlock Gen AI value. Yeah, that makes sense. And and when I think about leaders and let's say their workforce and how they prioritize, how can they start to shift their thinking, right? Like you talk about to maybe view generative AI as more of an integral part of their workforce, you know, kind of like hiring an, a, an extra employee. That's a great question. See, when you think about your workforce, right? Like you can think about Gen AI as a turbocharging element like a, to, for your workforce. Um, it's not simply do it cheaper, it's do it better, right? So you can imagine like contracts will be more airtight. You know, you'll be able to get to market and respond to things much faster. Let's say, imagine you've got the Gen AI agent that can draft RFP documents, evaluate the responses, you know, create your contracts uh, and a world-class lawyer at your disposal in minutes that can do this. Uh, maybe think of a Gen AI workforce enhancer that's able to give you natural language responses to all of your data. That's incredibly powerful. And be able to imagine there's a supply chain disruption. You're able to ask that question, tell me like what's the impact of sales of this particular supplier disruption happening in this region? And get that answer. Okay, now let's let me expedite and you can move quicker than others to respond to to this. So it really is like not simply cheaper, it's better. So the creativity, um, you know, and the comprehensiveness that it unlocks, it's incredibly powerful. It's like having the smartest person in the world in the room with you to help you solve some of those problems, isn't it? Okay, it well, let me ask you this way. Let me ask you this way. What happens to the companies, or I guess, what are the implications for the companies that don't adopt AI solutions? You know, the, the skeptics. How are they equipped to face challenges in the areas of sustainability, customer satisfaction, overall efficiency? and even competitive right. advantage. See, you know, I think the skeptics have a point, right? Like, let's tackle that. The skeptics, they've seen many different hype cycles. This is different, though. This truly is different. You know, Bill Gates and others say this is once-in-a-lifetime kind of a change. And what's... And industry, typically, there's a delay between technological capability and industry's adoption of it. And so... You know, we're still exploring where, you know, like and really figuring out how to unlock the value based on the technological advancement that's happened. There's, coming back to the implications, though, you know, mostly humans, we're not very good at understanding and comprehending the compounding effect. We tend to overestimate what will happen in two years and significantly underestimate what can happen in five years and 10 years. So the, the reality is that in two years, they're not going to go bankrupt. You know, they're not going to fall behind. But, you know, five to 10 years, if you don't build the organizational muscle to be able to unlock Gen AI's true potential, then, you know, com relative to your competitors, you're simply not going to be, effect you know, competitive. You would not be... Um, you know, able to respond to market disruptions. You would not be able to delight your customers. You would not be able to, you know, you know, do contracting where you're, you're limiting exposure to yourself. You're not able to meet your sustainability goals because the data is complex. So that's really the 
the risk is that you you fall behind in that mid to long term and this because it's just truly a disruptive once in a lifetime kind of a technology um you know th there's real risk out here on that note thanks so much for being here with the startup thanks for your your input awesome thanks so much take care